Greetings. Greetings, people of California, Michigan, New York, Ireland. A lot of people listen to the podcast in Ireland. Schlancha to you. And uh, what a day. I recorded a podcast today with uh, Moshe Kasher, who I love, who's a, a friend and is super talented, and I had a blast with. Uh, but then I had all kinds of technical issues trying to get everything to my producers at Midcoast Media. And, I re- and, and TikTok seems to think I want to blow up on uh, TikTok, or not TikTok, on uh, Instagram, Instagram Reels or whatever that I watch all fucking day now. Seems to think that I want to be a big producer. And it's telling me how to blow up my algorithm. I don't care. I honestly don't care. We're fine. We're doing just fine. I never I never wanted to be super famous. I like right where I am. Crawl my way to the middle. I'm staying right there. I got gigs. I got listeners. Whatever. I got a life. I don't fucking try to market. I didn't I didn't get into this to be a marketer, to go into advertising for myself. And become self-involved. It's it's enough. I already feel self-involved enough without spending my whole fucking day. Well, you need a hook line. Uh, you need to have a to direct them to action. Stop. Should you go play frisbee with your dog? For God's sake, have a life. Like I had a nice weekend yesterday. Had a nice full day. Got up. I had some late shows, so we got up around uh, 8.45, was on the beach at 9.30 doing my favorite yoga class with Morgan. If anybody ever wants to know about a great yoga class in Santa Monica on the beach, let me know. I'll, I'll turn you on to it. Um, did yoga, stretch it all. I don't know why I don't do it every day. I, I mean, it's like I used to do yoga. I started when I was in my 20s because I had a bad back from playing hockey. And then it worked. It straightened out my back. And every time it gets bad, I do yoga, gets better again. Lengthens, stretches. And there's always the possibility. It's not guaranteed. Nobody's going to put this in writing. But if you do it long enough and hard enough, you may, in fact, be able to blow yourself. And again, there's no studios in town that will show you a picture of that. But... It's implicit, and it's a reason why it's been going on for thousands of years, because there's always that possibility. By the way, if my mom is listening, this is a good episode to not listen to, not just because of what I just said, but because of the stuff I'm going to say with Moshe is a little scatological. It's a little um, filthy. He was a deviant, and we go into it a little bit. You may not want to hear that. Skip to the next one. Who do I got next week? I got uh, Tommy Tiernan, who's a great Irish comedian. You'll love him, Mom. Wait for that one. By the way, the, I noticed when I... The other technical problem is I noticed when I videotape myself during the interview, I cut off everything from my eyebrows up, which is kind of good. No one sees. No one needs to see the top of my head at this point, except my wife. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> anyway, uh, so I did morning yoga. I went to Penmar with Gibbons and Fitzgibbon and not Gubbins. He was he was off at watching the Rams game in person. So we went there, uh, had some lunch, saw a bunch of friends. You know, it's just a great hang. There's like people you run into that, that you haven't seen in a little bit. Dogs, lots of dogs, little kids, cute. And then it's funny because there's picnic tables and two outside there's a bunch of big screen TVs, but we were, we were set up so we could see the Rams game on one TV and the Jets game on the other TV while we're eating burgers. And I noticed that people congregate at their own tables in life. It's a metaphor, but we all stay at our own table. There was a table of old men, kind of retired. They'd played around to golf, and now they're they're just enjoying something. They got nowhere to go. They are lingering because it's they got to go back to a stucco apartment in Marina del Rey and watch Fox News. And who wants to do that? So they're kind of lingering in the sunshine, digging all the 
human vibes going on around them. And then there was a table of very attractive women who were doing a lot of pursing their lips and taking selfies with the golf course in the background. Okay, we get it. We get it. And then there was a table of, uh, how do you say it? Fat people. They were all fat. It's just weird. If I was overweight, I don't know that I would want to be seen with five other overweight people at the same table. Because I don't know that that doesn't intensify the, the visual experience for people. When they see you ordering, uh, and it's like, you got you to gotta say to the bus, boy, hey, keep an eye on us, will you? Don't leave a lot of empty plates on our table. It just it looks bad. Just get, here's an extra twenty. Just clear often, because there's going to be a lot of food coming through here. And they were they were having fun, but they kept standing up in front of the TV. It's like, come on, yeah, you're you're big. Don't don't stand in front of the TV. Uh, but I don't want to say anything. You know, cause if it was a skinny person, I would have said, hey, down in front. But when they're fat, you don't want to make a big deal. Uh, they're, they're, yeah, whatever. Um, what else did I do? Oh, and then me and Annie Letterman went for a big walk. And here's what's funny is Annie lives in Venice, and but she lives on kind of a not a great block. And I said, let's go for a walk. And we I walked her through the real Venice, down the walk streets, uh, through Washington on the canals. And she's like, wow, I feel like I've never even seen Venice before. Venice gets a bad rap and I'm sick of it. Venice is a multicultural, artistic, edgy, gritty, urban, beautiful, colorful, dynamic place. And it's not that dirty. It's really not. Um, it, there was a lot of homeless people during the pandemic and that shit blew up. On the internet, there was a lot of videos of homeless encampments, but a lot of that has been solved. A lot of those people have been put into uh, different housing or placed, and uh, it's not it's not that bad. So cut the shit and stop 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 rolling your eyes when I when I meet you in fucking Detroit and I tell you I'm from Venice. Why don't you look around? You go to Austin; those guys are all shitting on Venice. Hey, look at Sixth Street. Give me a break. Then I came home and uh, my daughter was with her two buddies and they had gone to, ready for this, a boxing club. Like it was outside. There was an event outside where what, her friend won a hundred bucks. Like you go in and you box other women with a lot of headgear and pretty big gloves. But fucking, she showed me video. They were wailing on each other. And uh, and they were pretty good. I got to say, I think my daughter got the bug. She wants to do kickboxing now. Uh, one of them got a bloody nose and cried, but then she was fine with it. And it was Venice, so there was a lot of tough chicks. There was a lot of tatted up girls with broad shoulders and bad backgrounds, miserable childhoods, taking it out on each other. So they got they got lucky. They, none of them got beat up too bad. So uh, So that's going to be her new thing. And then I made dinner for everybody. My friend Amir K, who's a very funny comic, he has a boat and he went out to Catalina Island. He comes up to me at the comedy store on Saturday night and he's like, you like tuna? And I'm like, yeah. I'm thinking like can of tuna, you know, Charlie the tuna, mayonnaise. And he's like, come out to my car. So I come out to his car and he opens up the back and he gives me a, a freeze-dried wrap uh, package of freshly caught tuna that he'd that he got at Catalina Island that day. He rode his boat out there and fished. He showed me the video. He brought in a tuna fish that was like fucking six feet long. It was crazy. And he gave me this fresh tuna. So I took it home. I went to the store and I got some uh, jalapeno and some soy sauce. And I got some collard greens. I fried those up. I sliced the jalapeno real thin. And then I, I have some high-end Japanese knives, and I did some sashimi with the, uh, uh, and uh, me and Owen sat down, and we had some sashimi, and I made some Israeli couscous on the side. It was real nice. So thank you to Amir K. Um, and that was my Sunday. How was your Sunday? Uh, my pool still alive in my pool. I took out four entries. Three out of the four are still alive. Detroit fucked me on that game. Overtime with a field goal. 
What's going on? Do I even want to talk about this? There's a lot of comedian news. Like Bill Maher can suck it. He's a piece of garbage. He's a fake fucking, you know, he's just, he's had writers for 20 years that have lived and died for him, that have sweat for him. And now he's fucking over the Writers Guild and continuing on to his show. And if I ever see him, I swear to God, I'm going to fucking punch him right in the belly. Not the face. You can prove that in court. I'm going to wait till he's just, we're kind of alone. And then I'm going to fucking gut punch that piece of shit. For being a scab, a fucking low life piece of shit scab. Anyway, I'm a little worked up about it. Um, what it seems like there's a lot of comics in the news. Uh, Russell Brand has been me too. I don't even know what that means anymore. Doesn't that seem like something from a bygone era? But it's still happening, and I'm not marginalizing the accusers. There's four women that claim various degrees of sexual assault from him. He, of course, denies everything. And now we're in a he said, she said situation, which will, I think, play out in court. I don't know if anyone's pressing charges or if this is all just out in the nether. But um, but he's he's a little fucked. And that's, here's the thing is like. I'm tired of all these comedians acting holier than thou. Like he's this guy who acts like. He's so fucking moral, you know, just shut up and tell jokes. He's not even a good comic. I, I respect his mind. I think he's a really kind of very smart guy, very informed. I mean, I don't agree with a lot of his opinions, but God bless him for having opinions. That's good. But, um, but don't put it all out there. Like you're like this guy, uh, Hassan, Hassan Minaj who is on The Daily Show, and I guess is a pretty big comic. I I've never met him. I've never seen him, but I guess he... Uh, there's a New Yorker article about how he claimed a lot of things in his stand-up that weren't true, um, that he embellished some truths. Some, some th- Here's the thing about that, is I lie all the time in my act, but it's stuff like... You know, it, it's things like, uh, yeah, my... Um, Saw a homeless guy and he said, Bluh. I don't know what I lie about. So most of my stuff is true, but you can tell when it's a lie. When I'm making something up, there's usually a very hard turn where you go, oh, that was a written joke. That's funny. And I mix that in with some real shit from my life. But the thing about Hassan Minaj is like he kind of puts himself out there as a spokesperson for brown people, for Indians or Muslims or however he identifies himself. And and because of that, he's taken very seriously and he's given a certain level of respect and obviously the accolades that come with it, as well as the, you know, career success that comes from being somebody who's serious and, and purposeful. And then it turns out it's all bullshit. All this stuff he say, he told some story about like that they sent anthrax to his house and the reporter checked with all the hospitals and checked with his door guy and his mailman and nobody could corroborate the story. And he said, oh yeah, I made that up. And he said, because, because of who he was, what race he was, that this happened. And he said that his prom date, um, fucking humiliated him at the prom because she didn't want her picture taken with him. Meanwhile, this girl got dragged because of it, like death threats. Her life was kind of fucked up. And it turns out he asked her to the prom. She said, no, that's all. She said, no. And then he made up this whole story that he showed up at her house and she had another guy there and the family kicked him out and all this bullshit ruined her life. I mean, whatever. I, all I'm saying is, if you're going to do comedy, just do fucking comedy. Stop, everybody stop trying to pretend. Oh, eh, eh, you know, the, the important thing is that I'm saying something. Shut the fuck up. Stop saying something. You know? Just, just be funny. It's a crutch saying something. I mean, if you're that good that you're killing and people are laughing, and you're saying something, hey, tip of the cap. That's fantastic. But I'm talking about people that have been doing it for three years, and they're already making big statements. They're getting a clap, do they call it, when people clap at the setup. Anyway, I don't want to shit on comedians. Speaking of me being a comedian, I'm going to be in Escondido at the Grand Comedy Club September 22nd and 23rd. Shirley Mass, October 5th, Manchester, New Hampshire, October 6th, Nashua the next night, Foxborough, Mass the next night, 
Sacramento, Arlington, Baltimore, Houston, Bakersfield, San Francisco, Fort Worth, all coming up. Go to FitzDog.com, get some tickets to come on out. Also, if you want tickets to other things like, say, sporting events, concerts, theater, then you are going to go to Game Time. It's fast and easy. It's a great way to get tickets without stressing about, am I buying them too early? Should I wait? Are tickets going to go down? Yes, they're going to go down. And then game time is going to let you swoop in, baby, and get a last-minute deal. Flash deals. You're going to hit a couple taps on your phone. It's going to download to the app. No printing, no transferring, none of that crap. You're just going to take a look, by the way, from the app at your seats and what you're going to be looking at from your seats. It's pretty amazing, and they have a guarantee if you find tickets that are cheaper. They've also got... um, uh, $20. Well, let me, here's the deal on it. Um, snag the tickets without the stress with game time, download the game time app, create an account and use code FitzDog for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem code FitzDog for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And right now I'm looking at tickets for John Mayer is uh, going to be in L.A. for like 83 bucks. That's not bad. No, no, I'm sorry. John Mayer is $339. Wait, there's somebody that I found that was like 38 bucks that looks good. Um, oh, Ed Sheeran, 58 bucks. This guy was the number one grossing touring act last year, and now his tickets are going for 58 bucks. What's up with that? Uh, but I would h- highly recommend John Mayer. Hozier. I really want to see Hozier. Those are 170 bucks. But it it whatever your area is, punch it in and it'll find what you want to find. Anyway, another great thing I want to talk about is HelloFresh. Farm fresh pre-proportioned, pre-portioned ingredients. Seasonal recipes delivered right to your to your doorstep. Uh, sk- don't go to the store. Don't like I love to cook, but I don't like to prep. I don't like to, you know, uh, I'm not a shopper. I'm a, I'm a cooker. So uh, fall is here, and this is a time to, like, get stuff delivered, and you can make a meal, and, uh, you know, you do the, you do the, you do the, um, you get the credit while they do all the actual work. They do, they do all the portioning and the shipping, and uh, it's great. And the fall is tough. It's busy. Your kids have games, football games. You're going out. You're trying to squeeze in the end of the summer, and you don't want to waste that time cooking and uh, shopping and doing all that stuff. So, uh, you know, for they have these quick and easy 15-minute meals. You can get dinner. It's, it takes less time than delivery and, and is cheaper. So uh, spend less time cooking and shopping and more time with your family. That's the way to do it. They got time-saving breakfast. They have kid-approved lunches and snacks. Uh, everybody stays happy with that. Me and my daughter cook together because Sundays in the fall, I watch football. I really like to watch football. And then I cook dinner because I feel guilty that I haven't done shit all day. And so last week I did a little Hello Fresh with my daughter. I made, uh, it was a chicken, what, what kind of chicken was it? Um, mozzarella crusted chicken. Oh, so good with fresh vegetables. They've also got like, I had a steak with this peppercorn sauce on it. Really delicious stuff, like restaurant quality. And uh, and you can cook it now and you can save money and you can make everybody happy. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 5050FitzDog and use code 5050FitzDog for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50FitzDog and use code 50FitzDog for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Uh, and then, oh, yeah, and then last night I watched, uh, after the football, me and the wife watched the se- season, no, series. I believe they did two seasons and they're done with this uh, uh, winning time about the Lakers back in the 80s. And, uh, you know, Magic Johnson versus Larry Bird, that whole matchup. Fucking great show. John C. Riley will win an Emmy. If he doesn't, something's horribly wrong with the universe. Um, 
Really enjoyed the show. Check it out if you haven't seen it. It's on HBO. And then, uh, and it's funny because they play the theme song is very funky and has like it's like a disco funk song. And since the show started, when we watched season one last year, I get up off the couch no matter what time it is, and I dance in front of the TV during the entire theme song, like disco moves. And my wife laughs, and uh, and I did it last night, and I pulled something in my ankle and she laughed even harder so isn't that sweet isn't that what marriage is all about trying to make the other person smile getting hurt and then they laugh how about that um all right we got a couple of pieces of mail mark g said oh no this is a, this is a uh i know obvious irony said when was the last time you said the word pathos out loud that was just a word that came to mind for me. Uh, I have not said pathos. That's the kind of name. That's the kind of word that like Hassan Minaj would say, or Bill Maher, or these comics that are saying something. I say words like fart and diarrhea, and tit. That's those are the words I enjoy. Not pathos. All right, couple quick overheards, and then we'll get going because it's kind of a long interview as well. Um, Mark G is standing at a gas station in North Idaho. Woman in front said to the cashier, we were riding dirt bikes and I felt weird. So I stopped and came here. The woman then paid for a tall boy, white claw, king size Snickers candy bar, and a clear blue pregnancy test and walked out of the store. Well, I think if you think you might be pregnant, then get on a fucking dirt bike for sure. Definitely challenge that fetus. Shake it loose. Uh, And by the way, if it's a gas station, don't just sell the pregnancy test. Plan B's same aisle. Eye level right next to it. Maybe you don't even need the pregnancy test. Just go straight for the plan B. That way you didn't know. You'll never look back and wonder. You just take the plan B and don't think about it. Right, people? Um, And then Blair Peltier, nice last name, rolls off the tongue, Peltier, uh, said, I assume that's a man, could be a woman, could be either, owner of a donut shop in Lafayette, Lafayette, uh, Louisiana. Uh, He said, uh, Saturday, as the morning was winding down, an elderly gay couple was sitting at a retro dining table sharing a cream puff that's that's a little on the nose, isn't it, guys? I overheard the Spryer gentleman say to the other one, I'm not proud. Are you proud? That is an interesting thing to put on gay people. It's like, who is proud? Like, I mean, I'm married. I'm going to say I'm proud. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. I'm fulfilled. I'm not proud. Proud sort of sounds like you're rubbing it in other people's faces. So what's with the pride march? What are you proud of? That you're gay? You're proud of that? I'm not proud of being straight. Don't be proud of being gay. Just be gay. Just suck it. Suck at the dick. Be happy. Be fulfilled with it. Play with the balls. You're gay. Anyway, uh, the other thing we want to talk about, speaking of gas stations, from the gas pump to the grocery store, your utility bills, your favorite streaming services, inflation is everywhere. Come on, make it stop. Thankfully, there's one company that's out there giving you a much-needed break. It's Mint Mobile. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just ready $15 $15 a month. I am ready for this. Uh, maybe as a sponsor, I should have gotten it already, but I am going to do it this week because Verizon sucks. All the big companies suck. They are multinational corporations that don't care about you. Their websites suck. They're hard to use. And, uh, you know, I think Mint Mobile is going to make things easier for everybody. It's obviously going to save you a lot of money. You can bundle it. Um, it's, it's just, you know, at a time when, you know, money's starting to tighten up. I'm noticing it. People aren't going out as much and you're looking for places to save. This is a great place to start. Uh, they, 
the, you go online, you eliminate by by doing it only online. They eliminate the traditional costs of retail. Pass it on to you. Unlimited talk and text plus high speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You use your own phone. You keep your own phone number and all your contacts. You have to worry about any of that stuff. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash Greg. That's mintmobile.com slash Greg. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Greg. By the way, support the sponsors, folks. They're what keeps the uh, oil in the uh, broiler here on the podcast. So um, make sure you remember to put in those codes when you do it. It helps me out a lot. I do appreciate it. All right. My guest today, who I also appreciate, is a guy who has been around for a long time doing really high-level quality comedy, podcasting, uh, written books, done a lot of specials. He's got this book called Casher in the Rye that talks about his crazy teenage years growing up in Oakland. He has deaf parents. Both his parents are deaf. And his father was like a Hasidic Jew. Very interesting life. Um, he's been on Fallon. He's been on John Oliver's show, Conan, Showtime, Chelsea Lately, all of it. Um, he was also a co-writer on Chappelle's show. Uh, he's done a lot. He's done a lot. And I was really happy to have him. He made it all the way from the Valley to Venice today. So I thank him. And here's my talk with the great Moshe Kasher. We're the exact right. same level of sort of legendary comic, and I came to you. We're talking about uh, we're talking with Moshe Kasher, who's bragging that he has a mm -hmm. car. I got a car. I live in Los Angeles, and to those that are listening at home, Greg has the audacity to tape a show that is, I would say, I would say, insultingly far away from my house. I do apologize for that, and I realize it generates <laughs> anger from a lot of guests. Do, so do, is this here. the beginning of every episode, it, it, basically? No, but I sense it. <laughs> Nobody says it, and I'm glad you said it. I finally brought it up. You know, I, I do surf, and I have a surfboard uh, strapped up to the top of my car, yeah. because that's what I have to do in order to justify doing your show. I have to chunk it with other activities well your wife won't do my show anymore is that true she doesn't she ghosts me she i'll doesn't work even reply. on her no it's fine dude if somebody doesn't reply to me i go i got it i i understand it's a favor somebody's doing when they do a podcast so i never want to be pushy god forbid it's helping your tour dates and you sell your <laughs> bullshit podcast yourself well but, wait what do you mean tour dates you mean like october the 11th or 14th at the san francisco punchline you're home, so I can't imagine a lot of people aren't going to come to that. <laughs> well, when I got the uh, when I got the Fitzsimmons bump, is that the first place you ever did stand up? First place I ever did stand up was the luggage store gallery in <laughs> uh, in San Francisco. Who's booking that? It, that was Tony Sparks. Have you ever? Do you know who Tony Sparks no. is? Tony Sparks is a. Uh, I, I don't. Why would you know who he is? But he there is a Tony Sparks in every town. Yeah, he is the guy, the like Godfather sweetheart of san francisco comedy yeah. responsible for every great comedian in the last 20 years to come out of san francisco and responsible for an infinite amount of unbelievably awful comics to you know he's just supports everybody so in a good way he encourages the good he encourages the bad and and god bless him one of the i mean a mensch, people a don't true mensch. realize that without those people Comedy would not be where it is today. A hundred percent. You know, Molly Schmank is like that at Schmink or Schmank? Schmink. Schmink. I should know because she's one of my dearest friends. But, but I always get her the name. The power right. of editing. You will know. No, no. I want her to know that I would not <laughs> That you that fucked close. that one up? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but she's a person that sits and nurtures and grooms. And Tom she's Sawyer a was like she's that. She's a classic groomer. She's a groomer. I remember. She's a entertainment industry groomer. Yes. That's what I've always said about her. And it's weird that this 12-year-old's performing stand-up at a grown-up club. Yeah. It's hard to get in at the punchline if you're not 12, actually. Yeah. It's kind of a weird situation. Well, you know, she was born a man. 
Molly? Yeah, well, anytime they switch, they groom. It's oh, just part right, of right. I've heard about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I heard about this because I've been breaking up a lot of, I've been doing a lot of um, direct action activism, breaking up story hours, but not drag queen story hours, just story hours generally. What's a story hour? Well, you know that they, the Proud Boys will go to like drag queen story hour at the oh, public when library. They read books. So I'm taking yeah. that activism a step further. I'm breaking up any story hour. I go into <laughs> kindergartens, I go into Barnes and Noble. I'm just, I, just to be safe, no more stories do being read to children. Do you break into people's homes yes. when parents are reading to their children? And that's hard to do because everybody's bedtime is a little bit different. So right. I'm kind of like Chris yeah. Kringle. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah, traveling. Yeah. I have a sl- I have an anti-groomer sleigh. Yeah. And, um, and by the way, Santa Claus is <laughs> such a groomer. He is a groomer. He's such a groomer. He, he breaks into your house and he's got a list yeah. of your kid if he's naughty or nice. And he, cur- he wants you to reach out to him and write him notes. Yeah, he wants you. What he do wants you letter. Want? He's got this sexless relationship with Mrs. Claus. I mean, there's no question they haven't had sex in hundreds yeah. of years. Yeah. He's surrounded by little guys, little, guys. little helpers. You yeah. know, He makes toys. All he thinks about is children. Nah. Santa's a groomer. By the way. And when one of them wants to be different and be like a dentist, he's like, no, you're going to be this. You're a, he also, not only is he a groomer, the motherfucker operates a sweat a sweat yeah, shop. It is a sweat it's, shop. It's hard to call it a sweat shop because it's in the North Pole and that's yeah. kind of a legal loophole yeah, because it's yeah. hard to sweat up there because right. it's so cold. But if it was in Malaysia, that's a yeah. sweatshop for They're sure. They're all Asian. They they <laughs> Disneyfied it, and made them white. By the way, as a Jewish <laughs> father, I will say um, everything I've said up until this point, I have believed in has been true and not a joke. But this really is true. Um, it is difficult to do to run defense on your child and Santa Claus around the Christmas uh, season. Yes, because Santa Claus, besides being a groomer, is so. I mean, this is another reason he is a groomer. He's so tantalizing. He's so, and it's so superior. Christmas is so unbelievably superior to Hanukkah. Like it's hard to, all we have, we have like a candelabra. Like if you're a Liberace yeah. fan, you might like uh, Hanukkah. Other than that, we got fried foods. We got a lot of nights. That's good. Yeah. Lot, but- oh, that's really good. I mean, that you guys really went for it. with Because first of all, cut the shit. Yeah. You got your holiday. First of all, Happy New Year to you. Oh, thank you very much. I, I should say uh, Shana Tova Umaluka. <laughs> Is that the Hawaiian pronunciation <laughs> of it? <laughs> Shana Tova Barada Umaluka. <laughs> I think he plays wide receiver for the Saints. <laughs> uh, you mean Shana Tova Umaluka? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man what's with all the uh hawaiians playing professional football now oh uh, well it crazy? I, don't, I don't know i know i actually weirdly know a lot about um hawaiian history but i don't know yeah. a lot about hawaiian contemporary stuff yeah and uh aren't they i mean they're they're yoked yeah yeah not yeah. they yeah. i hate saying you always do this to me it's not a, well it's not a, they're, they're a strong muscular they're, people <laughs> <laughs> their bone density is different <laughs> <laughs> and they're groomers. That's right. But now there's a wide receiver for the Rams who just set all kinds of records in his first two games for the most receptions in history of a rookie. And he is, I shouldn't say Hawaiian. Uh, He's what, Polynesian. Polynesian, I guess. Samoan. Maybe Samoan. Or I, Yeah, I don't know. I, I have done a lot of research about Polynesian history because it's like one of the most fascinating historical stories ever. I mean, Going how far back? Well... I got. I started getting. I read this book, a great book called J- uh, Hawaii by James Mishner. Um, oh, you know, no, yeah, yeah, you know I've heard James of that book. Yeah, yeah. Mishner's such an interesting guy because he uh, was like the Stephen King of his time, the right. biggest writer in the world, and long all, books, and right? Long historical fictions. Yeah. And he did, wrote Texas, Mexico, Hawaii. Right. And these like epic tomes of history, and nobody. He's, he's like. Um, Leon Uris is like that. Right. As well. He wrote South Pacific, which turned into the the the. Uh, a musical South right. Pacific and nobody knows who he is anymore. I mean, I'm sure o- old people do, but like he's not, he just doesn't stand the test of time for a lot of people, but right. he's so good. He was so rich. He was an orphan and then he died and he left all of his money to his alma mater. Some like random, I was trying to get the rights to one of his books once and wow. I had to like c- call a college cause he just didn't leave his, he left this like giant fortune to just some random private college in the middle of the country. That's anyway. amazing. Well, that's like, uh, well, Letterman did that with his college in Indiana. I forget the name of it, but it was just this little school in the middle of nowhere. And he built this, inc- like I, I did a show there. Huge communications building with like the best With radio. like 40 students in it. It yeah, like yeah, yeah, dwarfs exactly. how many people they yeah. can even support. Right. Um, 
Hawaiians, yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, should I go there? I'm... Well, I mean, all I know is about like when the when the plantation started and how they decimated the populations. Well, before that, was that the doles? That was the doles, and the whole the whole foundation of the state of Hawaii. Uh, I found out this is his, uh, history that they keep from you was just uh, I. Sugar, I think sugar and pineapple farm, American sugar and pineapple farmers trying to not pay um, tariffs. They literally overthrew a sovereign nation so no that they could get a tax kidding. break. And you blame my people for trying to get tax breaks. <laughs> they they <laughs> overthrew a sovereign nation. I think it maybe was the 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 last. No, I was going to so. say the last sovereign nation that we overthrew, but I guess we kind of did that in Iraq. But it probably like in our name, yeah. To in, like officially, they just straight up overthrew the sovereign leader of Hawaii and uh, no one in America was into it. Nobody, everybody was like, this is wrong. Like uh, the, the, the voters were like, this is wrong. It's evil. We can't do this. It was it a military action or was it, it just was like corporate? a paramilitary action, like a corporate paramilitary yeah. action that then turned, I believe I might be wrong, that then turned into an official military action because I think the president at the time said, no, you can't do that. But then he like died or mysteriously was, or, or was vote. No, 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 it wasn't connected, but yeah. or was voted out of office. I don't remember. And then in came uh, uh, the I think it was Teddy Roosevelt, I think. And he was like, yeah, let's do this. And so they just took it and then it became the 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 a state in the United States. That's so Teddy. Yeah, it's so that's so Teddy. That's yeah. what, I, I'm pitching a show for Disney Plus <laughs> called That's So Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about Theodore Roosevelt and Opening expansion. scene, he just walks, runs in on a horse. <laughs> yeah, he was a really bad guy, and a, he was a re, he was a genocide. He yeah. committed genocide, but you know, he grew up. He was like a little asthmatic yeah. kid who like had no friends, and he were his father was amazing because he ran orphanages all over New York City during the Depression, and and Teddy was there. Like, was it, the, no, it would have been before the Depression, right? I don't, yeah, 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 I think so. Right, but, if he was a little kid, yeah. Yeah, so he was, but he, and then his father just fucking said, you're not going to be a pussy. And, and he made him hike all around Europe. He definitely wasn't. I mean, he was a beta male ascendant. Totally, he turned he, him into one. He he became alpha, like, yeah. just through sheer force of determination. Yeah. Like, um, I'm a kind of, I, I, in that way I relate to him cause I'm a kind of a like classic beta, but with an alpha rising, like I, I really desired, like I, in some ways I'm like, uh, I, I like masculinity and manhood. I have a big truck. I yeah. have a, I like to try to repair things even though I don't have any aptitude for it. Yeah. I wish that I was, um, I wish I was more of a man than I am. And as a result of that, I've become more of a man than I could have, than I was promised to be. Yeah, I think of you that way. I do, because I feel like you're very in touch with your feminine side. You know, like you walk in here with this shirt that I immediately <laughs> complimented you on, but it's made of like taffeta. Dandy Del Mar, by the way. That's the name that of the company. How'd yeah, you get free clothes from them? I don't want to talk about that. That's like sort of a trade secret. Listen, I write these companies. I say, hey, can I have some free shit? I'll shout it out on my podcast. And then they send me some free shit. Dude, that's genius. I mean, you can do it too. I love swag. All you, I do, all I wear is too. Adidas. Everything is Adidas. Well, that the okay. Now the problem becomes Adidas isn't giving anybody shit. You know, oh. that's the hard thing. You got to be like you know LeBron to get Adidas to notice you when you write them. But you do a mid, and then if you go too small. If it's a tiny they little company, they can't it. afford to send you shit. So you're looking for mid-tier got companies it. that kind of have an aesthetic similar to what you got going on. And then you just say, hey, I'm Greg Fitzsimmons. I've been on Stern. I've been on blah, blah, blah. I got, blah, blah. I got this followers. I got this wonderful podcast that's been going for so long, although it still is, I would say, prohibitively far away from most of my guests. And it's a disrespect to even ask them to do it. But I, I got blah, blah, blah. I'd love to wear some some of your stuff on yeah. the thing, and I'll shout you out. I, I would tell you, 
seven out of ten of the companies you write will send and you shit. And who do you? How do you reach out to them? LinkedIn. On on LinkedIn, yeah. Is that I send them my out? resume. No, on Instagram. Yeah. Oh, on Instagram. <laughs> Great. I'm so out of it. <laughs> I mean, I'm old because I only use Instagram. <laughs> Real young people are using TikTok, and yeah. I can barely I can barely uh, access the algorithm. Yeah. But I guarantee. And by the way, it's not just clothes. How are we getting into this? It's not just clothes. You what? Are you, are you a golfer? You look. Oh, like, yeah, you I look, love to play golf. To, find a golf golf clothing place or a, a golf club but you, again you can't go with whatever the hugest company in the world is because they probably will ignore you you go with like some mid-tier public you know, course that's looking for new golfers yeah something like that i love it i love it so let's break you down more yeah you've got uh a mustache that's got a mustache. very porny and you know that i'm sure it's you probably have jokes <laughs> about it in your act no it's so i don't think silly every, I, everybody said people say i look like creepy or a cop with the mustache yeah do you think i should get rid of it no i, I go back not. and forth on no 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 and i like it and i like that like me it comes in kind of orangey yeah, kinda, yeah well you know what it is you'll like this greg uh, it is my Irish ancestry fighting its way oh, out. Oh, nice! Yeah, you've been trying. It's it's essentially my face. Essentially saying you've been trying to you know front load the Jew stuff, motherfucker. But don't forget about us, <laughs> right. fighting Irish, right. fighting its right. way out. Yeah. This is in fact the, the truly my Irish ancestry. I have Irish ancestry. Yeah, and it wants out. And then out. you got glasses that are definitely the feminine. They're Faye Dunaway glasses. They're oversized, uh -huh. <laughs> kind of you know taupe colored with a brand logo on the side. When, when what I brand is it? You know, come on. Are we, is do it we Gucci have to do or that? something? I think it is Gucci. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Listen, when I get up in the morning and I know I'm doing your show, I'm thinking I'm going Faye Dunaway today. Yeah. I'm thinking that's what I'm right, going to do. Right. And then the haircut is very 90s. It's new wave. Sort of foppish a little bit. It's, yeah, you could go back to foppish. Moppy foppy. I, um, but also, you know, I, I, I can... I did the plumbing in my house. Well, that's that's pretty cool. Not the in my house, but I rebuilt the sink, things Amazing. and things like that. Like I always feel did like you the, do it on YouTube. Did you learn how to do? Yeah, it on I'll YouTube? do YouTube a yeah. lot. And and I I know for sure it's almost it's not um uh, subconscious. It's conscious. I know that it's because I want to feel like I have value outside of like the 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 fine you know the comedy arts and the writing i want to know like i am a person yeah. that can do things right because of the uh, impending apocalypse i want to be able to i feel barter. like the most satisfying uh, of of the most satisfying things i've done in the last 20 years was i built a, it started off as a small tree fort with my son yeah and i lost my mind i was going to home depot every other day it turned into like a condo complex yeah it yeah. had multiple rooms it had a fireman bar it had a rock climbing wall it um, had a zip line that's pretty um, impressive it's where, a, where is it now we we took it down because we wanted to have a, the kids got older and Did we wanted cry? to cry yeah, a little bit. Really? It, it, I took a lot of photos. I was very... And then we built a go-kart together. My grandfather... You know, this is a big part of it, too. My grandfather was actually a man, like a real man. Yeah. And um, he's uh, not on the Jewish side. And... Um, oh, is he on the Irish side? Yeah. I mean, obviously. There you go. Uh, um, he built uh, a this cabin in Mendocino that is in my family. He built it basic, essentially by hand. We always say by hand, but I yeah. mean, he didn't lift the logs with his bare hands, but he built this cabin and he, he was a builder, but he was also an English professor. He's yeah. kind of who I think I want to be, although he was also kind of a, uh, a, a wife abuser. So yeah. th that part I'm going to, I'll opt out of, okay. but he, I have these essays that he wrote me because he was a writer, an English professor, uh, that he wrote me when I was a little kid. And they're these really funny, they're comedic, kind of like essays from grandfather to grandson about um, one of them in particular is about how to build a treehouse because wow. we have a treehouse at the spot in Mendocino and it's a it's a comedic piece you know it's all about like um, build it high enough that only giraffes can come in but you have to be able to feed the giraffes to get them to go away but when grown-ups come they won't be able to, to access the treehouse you can uh. throw things at them but then there's also building instructions like legitimate building instructions on how to how he built the treehouse and how to you know it gives all the specs and all the the supplies that you need yeah. so that's sort of the paradigmatic um al alpha beta in my in my life is like so are you going to build one on uh, cuz I've been to your house you got room you got a lawn we could build a tree house what i would rather do is um is uh, improve the one that my, my grandfather built me because it's very old and it's now rotted out. Oh, you out. still have a house up in Mendocino? I still have that cabin, yeah. It's still no in my family. No shit! Yeah. 
That's amazing. You want to go? Yes. We should go podcast there. It's a, just about the right commute for you. <laughs> you're not going to let it go. No, I just thought it'd be fun. You know? But honestly, Greg, you could go. I always tell people, and not your listeners, but my friends, go up there because it's it's uninhabited 90% of the time. And I'm like, I want my friends to go up there and see it. But nobody ever takes me is up on gonna it. Is there going to be a wolverine in there or something? We show no, up? although there is, um, there is a mountain lion somewhere in the area oh, that has been cool. reported. Yeah. I lived up there for like... Uh, like six months or so during the pandemic, my, me and my whole family were up there, and yeah. it was, uh, it's so beautiful. Is Mendocino Marin County? Mendocino is Mendocino County. So it's Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt. Okay. Wow. So it's yeah, pretty far Yeah, my daughter up. was going to school up in Santa Rosa for a little while. Yeah. Do you know that town? I do. Yeah. I used to go to raves in Santa Rosa. Did Actually, you? I was just in Santa Rosa with my look that you're describing so well. Yeah. I have this uh, RV because that's a part of my uh, alpha. I, it's not an RV. It's like a, a man's RV. Okay. Does that make sense? It's Is like it a, a jet stream or it's whatever like an, it's called? No, it's, like it's, it's called like an overlander. It, it, like uh, That's the style. It's like a big lifted four-wheel drive-y looking kind of. Oh, it's got, oh, it's not a trailer that you hook onto no, a truck. No, it's an you actual, it's a, it's a big old truck. Can I take that to the cabin? No, now that is where I draw the line. <laughs> but, so that's a part of it. It's got big old tires and I go camping in it and it's like my favorite thing to do and it's my prized possession. I value it more than my family's lives. Um, and I was sitting on the side of the road because I was trying to send a text message and in Santa Rosa, which is a very uh, Northern California kind of hippie town, but Probably a little bit of drugs, too. That, and it's also the uh, Charles Schultz Museum is there. That's right. Yeah. The, yeah. The Charlie Brown thing. So I'm pulled over on the side of the road. I've never had this happen to me. I have these glasses on, actually. And all of a sudden, I'm deep in text, and I look up, and I'm in the, you know, like hour four of a very long drive, because I'm trying to get all the way to LA. So I'm a little cracked out. And I look up, and this woman is walking towards me, like, smiling and kind of, like, waving. And I, uh, I... I like roll down the window and she's like, she's like, Hey, I was like, hi. And she's like, it's a nice vehicle. I go, okay. She's like, what you up to? I go, I'm, can I help you? And yeah. she goes, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, Whoa, that was a little aggressive. And I go, what are you talking about? And then all of a sudden, another woman comes out of the, the passenger side, and they're kind of coming up. Yeah. And I go, and she's like, I thought you were cool, like a traveler or something. Uh -huh. I, and I said, yeah, I am a traveler, and I'm actually traveling away from you right now. Yeah. And she turns around, throws her hands up to the other girl, and she goes, he was not cool. And I go back to the car. <laughs> and I was, it was so surreal. I was oh, like, what did this woman want? I mean, it's yeah. got to be either drugs. Right. Uh, just... Uh, she pulls over and gives like random threesomes and RVs uh, yep. to any man. Or I was yeah, about to get robbed. By, or I was about to get robbed by gunpoint yeah. by her boyfriend at the Motel Six. I came out for pilot season one year back when there was a pilot season and back when I had hair and there was a dream. And I was outside Warner Brothers, and this very attractive woman in like a halter top and short shorts comes up to me, flip flops, and she goes, uh, she hands me a camera and she goes, "Will you take my picture?" And I'm like, she goes, I need it for a headshot. I have an audition. I was like, okay. <laughs> That's so how headshots work. Some <laughs> random guy <laughs> with a Polaroid camera. So I take her picture and she keeps posing and I'm taking pictures. And then she goes, um, my house is right here. And she points to a house. Uh -huh. And she goes, do you mind coming in and taking some more pictures of me? And I was like, what kind of pictures? And she's like, well, I need something like a little bit sexier. And I was like, uh, well, there's a lot of scenarios here, but I think they all end in a, <laughs> get a ball gag. No, all but one. There's <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah. There's an outlier. There's an infinitesimal outlier of a possibility that all of your fantasies come true. Yeah, right. I, I, yeah. And so you didn't go? No. I did this thing once where this was exactly the phenomenon you're talking about. I randomly hit on this girl. Um, in a in a parking lot that I was, she was. <laughs> oh, you used to be a player. I forgot about I, that. I I would call it a slut. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. it's less. It's uh, as an adult and a dad and a husband. Now, in retrospect, it's like it used to be like check out these stories, and now yeah. it's kind of like I now got you these. Put it on the shelf. I got these stories, but this is yeah. kind of the phenomenon you're talking about. I had hit on some girl in a parking lot who was literally the parking lot, like the parking attendant. Yeah. And uh, she gave me her phone number, and I was off. 
um, doing a show. I had driven that was in uh, what in Hollywood, and then I drove down to Lo- Long Beach to do a show. Yeah, and I was texting with her, and it got very racy very quickly, like aggressively racy. Like, you know, I like. Oh, oh, I wish you'd, uh, you told me that you were hitting on me. You know, I would have, I don't want to say, but you yeah. know, I, I would have whatever in the parking lot. So I, I, so now I'm like in the show, not even thinking about the stand up. I'm just horny, you know, like texting with a heart on. Yeah. And I, I had gone down there with a friend, um, Jacob Siroff. And I'm like, Jake. And then she said, I go, where do you live? And she says, Compton. <laughs> and, I'm, and I look at the map, and Compton's on the way back. Was she black? She was not black. Okay. In fact, she was racist. That came up later. Um, but she, uh, Compton is on the way back to my house from yep. Long Beach. Yep. And I'm like, I can make this work. I mean, now I'm in, like, frenzy. Like, yeah. I used to get so horny and sex addicty that I would get cold. Yeah. You I've know that? There. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> it's like you feel so simian. You, you know? feel like you are being pulled out to sea. Yes. I, like, you're not in control. It's taking you. A hundred percent. And yeah. and you become more simian, more ape. Like, yeah. you, it's not... A, th- a thinking it's a it's a physiological yes. like um longing it's a it's an alarm has been turned on so i'm like okay compton long beach um now you know you're in trouble and i said to jacob now i'm like i gotta get jacob out of my car yeah like he's got to find another ride home yeah. so i start going up to all the comics anybody live on the east side anybody <laughs> live on the east side and one one comic i think it was jen murphy yeah. uh was like yeah, i do i go can you please take my friend home and so i sloughed him off to jen murphy i get in the car and i start driving to fucking compton and i pull i'm texting with the girl the whole time i'm like horny out of my mind and she's like uh she's like okay here's where i live and i pull in and it's like I mean, it would, it it was like set designed of like place that that man who looks like you is gonna get robbed. Yeah. And I go, where's your house? She goes, you have to pull down the alley. And I I'm I'm driving forward. Suddenly you're like uh, you're like Ray Liotta's wife in Goodfellas. Yeah, the coat's right down yeah. there on the right. Yeah, just keep going down on the right. Exactly. Yeah. And I keep, but I'm not like I'm going on purpose. Uh, did she want the coat? Or was she just scared? She was just no. She wanted the she coat wanted the until coat. she me. until it dawned on her that she was being set up. It's dawning that I'm being set up. Yeah. While but I also want the coat. Yeah, I right, really right, want the coat. Right. But I've already. I know I'm getting set up, and I'm driving down this alley. And to the left is a an abandoned field, uh-huh. and to the right is like these tract homes, like one after another. And I'm like, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't uh, create. A better physical scenario to rob and kill an unsuspecting, horny, white idiot yeah. in Compton. And yet I'm still driving forward. My foot's still on the gas. I'm uh-huh. still going. And she, I got there. Anyway, it, was a, it ends up being a happy ending. Oh, uh, nice. It, I got there. And uh, she, even though, except for the racism, um, it was a you know, somewhat pleasant experience. Yeah. She came out and was just like... Compton, I fucking hate living in Compton, surrounded by all these black people. And I was just like, at that point, I was too far in to be like, actually, that's very offensive language, and I don't appreciate that. So we and your reaction is going da 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 da. da. <laughs> it grows up, splits into two, becomes earplugs. <laughs> so, hey, what did you say? <laughs> but anyway, I'll never forget that feeling of going, I'm so horny that I know. I might be driving to my doom and yeah, I'm still driving. And right. I did it. I took it all the way. Right. I wasn't smart enough to do what you did, which is not go in the house. Yeah, me and uh, me and my friend Frank, we were like maybe like 16 or 17 and we used to go into the comedy club. I grew up just outside of New York. And so uh, we used to drive in on, uh, at night and we'd go to the comedy clubs. And so we were at, I don't know how we got to talk to this girl. It was outside the club. We came out and she was... You know, black chick, super hot, and she was flirty with us. And we're like, all right, this is unusual. Mm-hmm, we're sure. young. She's a little older than us. And then she goes- You had performed? No, we were watching. You were random. Although we, I'm embarrassed to say, we used to go heckle. <laughs> we were 16-year-old kids with fake IDs, and we would heckle like Paul wow, Reiser. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. The karma, man. And and then, you must feel that way anytime you get heckled. Like oh, I deserve it. I deserve this. Yeah. Um, and so, we, and then we would drive home and we'd go over what our good heckles were, and, uh, and <laughs> it wasn't like you suck. It was more just tagging jokes. Yeah, sure, sure. 
And uh, it's like being at a at, when you're at a, a uh, when you do stand up in England or at a black room. Yeah, it's like the heckles aren't going to be you suck. The heckles are going to be a line funnier than you just said. Exactly. So you, <laughs> you better bring your A game. Like you, you, you never want the audience to go like, now that audience member, that guy was right, very clever. Right, right. Although sometimes you have to not feng shui. What do you, what do you call it when the the Asian term for when you use somebody's energy? I like you, judo. You don't go count. Aikido. You, judo. You, Aikido. You, you go aikido, and sometimes you just take what they said and then you tag oh, that and then you give them credit 100%. and you go this dude's this, you know my line always when someone says something genuinely funny is i laugh and i genuinely laugh and then i say don't ever be don't ever be funnier than the performer it's right. incredibly and then disrespectful you get the power right back i again. admit that it was great yeah, yeah, and then yeah, we yeah, keep yeah. moving exactly so um so we pick up this so then she goes can you guys give me a ride home and she lives in the south bronx in like a really sure. fucking scary neighborhood so we drive her there, and she was kind of insinuating that a three-way was going to go down. Yeah. And so we got there, and then I was fucking around with her, and she got offended by whatever I was saying. And so we got there, and it turned into, you can come in. You're going to stay in the car. So she brought <laughs> You had to stay in the car. I had to stay in the car. It's like the, uh, the warriors. You're just like sitting in the car hoping nothing happens to you. He so, went up? So he goes up. And I'm out in the car, and some guys come by, and they they start standing near me, and then closer, and then closer, and then I was like, "Fuck it's this!" And I dro- I drove away. <laughs> no, you left your friend. This is no cell phones. We had no cell phones or anything like that. So I left my friend, and then not permanently, but I was like, "I can't yeah. sit here." Yeah. And so I just kept doing laps, and every time I do a lap, they'd walk up again, and. And then he came out, and like apparently he just had raucous, crazy sex with her. And oh. then I drove him home. If you just kept your fucking mouth shut, you could have been in there. I've done. I've blown it several times with my I've, stupid mouth. I have too. I've blown it. I've blown it. Uh, and from bad decision making, you were you were making me remember. I was once upon a time at the comedy store, and I had like the horny um, sex addict's dilemma. One of the ultimate Sophie's choices of a young horny single comedian. Um, these two girls came up to me and were like, C- can we come back and hang out with you? And I'm like, hmm. And then this like, it was in La Jolla. And so it's this like hot, rich, 60 year old, like La Jolla, you know, cougar gilf. Was really? Like, Here's my phone number. And I'm like, I'm looking at these two <laughs> things. I'm like, which is, what is the, the hotter thing here? What's, I can't, I can't determine. A night with one um, older, much older woman or a night with two young women. Like I truly, it, it, it was yeah. a, it was a real difficult, um, equation. And finally I pushed my chips in on the threesome. Yeah. We went back to my hotel room and, um, it became immediately clear that the, the other girl was like, had been taken hostage by her friend and Wasn't she's, she's hiding on the balcony uh. and the girl's like pulling tugging me into the bed while there's like literally just a random stranger like looking off into the distance and we like sort of made out on the bed and then the girl like knocked on the glass window slider was like it's time to go and we left i made the wrong decision that night yeah and it haunts me to this day i got a question i just saw this tiktok Mm. because i am young and in touch with kind of um what young people do so i would look at tiktok and there was it's this street interviewer asking Japanese women if they think prostitution is uh, cheating. Yeah. And they I would say 75, 80 percent of them were like, no, it's not cheating now. Yeah. Obviously, it is in our culture. Yeah. But um, what do you think? I think that it's every marriage is different. And I certainly think that there are some men whose wives just check out on sex yeah yeah and they just feel like it's a job and it's a burden and they're over it and i think if they have an understanding that this guy's gonna go you know go to a massage place and get a happy like they're just like just don't fucking talk about it you know there's a reason why there's a jack shack every other block all over los angeles yeah yeah i mean I wouldn't... those are not single guys going in there you think so you think it's all married men i think so you know i we interviewed a um a sex worker on our uh podcast on natasha my podcast yeah. uh the endless honeymoon podcast have you done that yeah 
Oh yeah, you should come back. Um, we we uh, tape in um, <laughs> Pacoima. <laughs> you like it? No, um, but she was basically saying that like the large majority of her clientele are married, and she's and they and she was saying. I mean, all of the stereotypes you think are true are true. The the more humiliating and degrading uh, sex act they ask for, the more personally empowered they are in their regular life. Like if CEOs, doctors, yeah, lawyers, yeah. they all want to be humiliated right. and pissed on and whipped and talked to like a slave boy. Like that is, it's it's all, everything is true. Because it's the opposite of how they live. I guess so. Like that to Meanwhile, me. me and you just want to be treated nice. Yeah. <laughs> We're just comedians. We just like, just, I don't need to fuck you. Could you just laugh at my jokes? <laughs> just be kind. <laughs> just don't heckle me. Do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder about that like what uh like what what it is that requires wanting to be in control sexually and wanting to lose control sexually what is it in in the mind that wants one thing or another that creates that like are you a believer in um in fetishes like being oh, connected to a thing that occurred as, in your youth um, oh, I never thought about it as being can I, I guess, yeah, most fetishes do go back to childhood. Like I mean, the ultimate example is the foot fetish. And it's like, you know, mom used to take me shoe shopping and I would look at all the ladies with their nylons putting a, a foot fetish to me, by the way, is like, I can't. Do you like feet? You know, I, I don't have a fetish, but like I can appreciate a nice foot. The arousal? Uh, you jerk off through one? No, I haven't jerked off to it. But like if I see... A woman who's attractive, I will glance down. You look down. at the feet. I'll glance down. I'll never be able to forget Russell Peters said he needs to be making eye contact with the foot in order to uh, achieve orgasm. No kidding. Like, a, it, he likes everything. Yeah. But when it comes time for the end, he's got to, like, find an angle. And if the feet are buried under, like, a snuggly blanket or something, really? it's, it's just not happening. That's amazing. <laughs> it's a, I just don't, re I relate so little. Yeah. Because feet are just feet to me. They don't do, they just, there's nothing there for me. I look at it also as, like, lucky me. Because, like, most guys are into tits. They're always covered up. Uh -huh. Me, springtime, the flip-flops come out. <laughs> you know, I was talking about, speaking of that uh, arousal on what you see, about Burning Man. This I was at Burning Man this year. Um, no. This, yes, I was there. Well, this is my 20, you know, I go every year. No, but did you get trapped this year? I mean, it was such, Greg, it was such fucking hype. It was oh, such bullshit. Really? You were reading. In fact, if anything, the media coverage of it made people panic. Not they the said 70,000 people were trapped there. Well, 70,000 people were there. Yeah. And you couldn't leave for two days. Yeah. But so it's like everybody was planning on leaving on Sunday or Monday and instead they left on Monday or Tuesday. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. the way they were covering it was, was that it was like, um, you know, like uh, Hurricane Katrina. But yeah. actually it was like a minor inconvenience and people were loving it because everybody hates burn to, loves to hate on Burning Man and, and Burning Man people. And people were like, oh, look at these. Uh, this comes back to our alpha conversation. They go like like in my comments are like, I love it. P uh, rich people cosplaying as poor people suffering. I love it. Yeah. And I was like, you don't know what this is. These are not rich people cosplaying as poor people. These are weak people cosplaying as survivalists. They've been they love this. Yeah. Like this is finally after uh, you know decades of this being actually a an incredibly easy experience. But it's hot. People always go, oh, it's a very rough environment out there. It's hot. It's like, yeah. it's hot here. It's, it's hot in LA. You, know? you have to yeah. But so now they were like, "Oh, my survivalist skills of I, I can make it through that. 48 that's, hours in the mud." That's an interesting insight. It's, it's true. Kind of like the reality of what you've been playing for the last 2 days. And everybody loved it. I tell you what, like there was I've now I've good friends. One of my friends has an RV. Him and he's got four brothers. They have an RV. They leave in Reno. Uh -huh. Once a year, they go get the RV. It oh, sits it's there just all year. For that. It's just to go to Burning Man, and they've gone for like yeah, like 15, 20 years. Yeah, everybody, as far as I could see, was like loving life. Yeah, like that we were mu like you know stumbling through the mud, putting like plastic bags over socks, over then another sock, and then another plastic bag. Like all these like best practices on how to make it through the mud. I mean, was it pathetic? Sure, a little bit, but it was fun. <laughs> it was, was Natasha with you? Oh no, no, yeah, no. She no. doesn't do it. I was laughing so. Well, she did it. I made some tactical errors. I brought Natasha once. The, my problem is I used to work there. And so I have no shit. Yeah, I worked there for a long time, for like 15 years. And so my whole circle of friends there is um, like uh, Nick Kroll came and we hung out there once and, and he was making fun of me 
saying basically I hang I hang out with like the blue collar uh, strata uh-huh. of Burning Man. I'm, yeah. It's like I'm with the working. I'm like with the Doc men. Right. And you know Get he's because Nick was off in this camp with all these like beautiful people. Right. You know like having hors d'oeuvres and the, uh-huh. these like beautiful costumes. And I'm like come meet my friends. And it's just like a tank. And I'm just like look, it's a custom built <laughs> tank that we made or whatever. And uh, again, it's because of my like alpha desires or whatever. Yeah. So I bring Natasha. Unfortunately, Natasha is much more on the where Kroll was tip. But I've got this whole infrastructure for the people I've been camping with for 20 years. That it, so I bring her there two years in a row camping with these like fucking you know essentially like season two of The Wire. Yeah. Uh, and then and then the third year she was pregnant and I was like, oh, you should just come. That was mm. that was my that was the end of yeah, that experiment. Yeah. She never came back and we'll Wait, never so come we were back. talking about fetishes and then you brought up uh, Burning Man. Did yeah. I cut you off? No. Oh, I was just asking what if you thought they that they come from birth. But actually, you know what? I got a story about a fetish yeah. at Burning Man. It connects. It connects. I was just looking through. Um, the reason this person came into my mind again is because they um, uh, they transitioned, which is like a really interesting. Um, I've been alive a long time yeah. when someone that you slept with is has tr- has transitioned oh, and, is a, and is a man now. Yeah. I was like, now that I'm doing a bit about on stage where I'm like, do you know what this re- means? I'm bisexual. I've been bisexual this whole time. Like all these jobs I got looked over for as a straight yeah. white man. You could have told me. But anyway, they um, the, because they came into my feed and I was like, oh, wow, how interesting. I was recalling our our sexual interaction and i still had facebook does this very creepy thing where they save the like a decade's worth of correspondence and i was like i wonder if i could find it and i did find it and they were like we had slept together and then they i think they wrote me or i wrote them and was like uh no no they wrote me and were like sorry that was a little awkward and i was like oh it's okay i just felt yeah it was i remember that the the sex was like kind of it wasn't bad. It was just, you know, there was something off. And they were like, yeah, I think it was because I wasn't able to tell you what I really wanted. And I was like, oh, well, I wish I'm reading this correspondence. Yeah. Well, I wish you had just told me, like, just tell me. And and they were like, well, it's hard for me to get off unless I engage in, <laughs> in brother, sister, <laughs> incest play. And I was like, oh, Oh, okay. Like, I don't know what I said if I was like, oh, yeah, I could have been your bro or whatever. (laughs) You're you're fucking her and you're like, get such an asshole. (laughs) I hate our bedtime. Our bedtime sucks. Oh, man. I wish he didn't go to church still. Yeah. I mean, it was, that was definitely, sometimes you play uh, when you're in the um, alternative community. Yeah. You're like, yeah, hey, I'm a freak. I'm a freak. And then right. the person that you encounter is like, oh, you are? Here's what I'm into. You're like, oh, I guess I'm I'm kind of like a square. I, right. I remember this other girl once. I'm trying to think if I ever slept with somebody that got kinky. At all? I mean, you know, like a little bit of choking, a little bit of hair pulling. Sure. Classic, like a, a entry level. Yeah, I don't know that it ever got crazier than that. I mean, brother sister incest play, that's pretty crazy. That's pretty high up in the uh in the kink, I think. In the in the intellectual kink, right? Yeah. Like cuz there's all the physical kink where it's like I'm tying you up, I'm pouring urine on you, like right. this was this is all kink of the mind. Yeah. I had one person once early when I first moved to LA um that uh she was like uh we were we were kind of like kissing, and I was smoking cigarettes, and she was like, uh, "Yeah, uh, yeah, take the put it out on me." And I go, "What?" Oh, and she's like, shit. "Put it out on me." I'm like, "I was like, no, like no, I'm not, I won't." I mean, I wanted to like be supportive, so I kind of like you know flicked a couple ashes on yeah. her, but I was like, "I'm not gonna put us." What are you crazy? Yeah. So anyway, we're we're hooking up later. I, but it just goes to show you who the kind of like what she was into. We're hooking up later, and she's g- going down on me, and she keeps like biting me. Uh-huh. And I go, "Ow, ow, stop!" And she's like, "She's like, oh, sorry." And then she bites me again, and and then she stops all of a sudden, and she's like, "What is this?" And it's the kind of "What is this?" You know that tone of like, "You, there's something wrong with your dick." Like, yeah. Like, what is it? Like you're, you've got something. Uh-huh. And I go, "What is what? What is what?" And I look down, and there's like a fucking contusion on my balls and i go 
I go, what is this? This is you. Yeah, you are yeah, this. Yeah. You just did this. Uh, yeah, Dracula oh. has has burst a blood like this, and it was so hardcore. I kind of wrapped it up, and um, and I was like, yeah, I, you wrapped it up. Yeah, and, I mean, and then I texted her like a few days later, and I go, because she was really cute, and I kind of liked her, but I was just like, that was so hardcore. I wrote her. I go, hey, I just. Um, that was fun, but I think like maybe you play a little too rough for me. Yeah. And I remember she wrote back instantly. She was like, okay, no problem. We don't have to see each other anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> I thought, wow, that's impressive. Like not even a like, oh, I can dial it back yeah, or yeah. we can word nego- No, it's just like, uh, if you don't like me chomping on your testicles as yeah. hard as I possibly can, yeah, we're yeah. not a match. Yeah, it's we're over. Not, yeah. <laughs> By the way, my mom listens to my podcast. It just dawned on me <laughs> oh, no. that she listens. She she started listening about a oh, year ago. I'm sorry, Mrs. Fitzsimmons. I felt self conscious about this podcast this whole time. Actually, yeah, mom, I uh, I never choked anybody. It was it was gentle. It was a gentle massage. Listen, I'm a father now. Yeah, I'm a married man. I my sex life is much more um, straightforward Christian American values. Yep, Santa Claus style. Good for you. Thank you very much. God, it's hard to step back from the. Um, that's the thing is like I wonder if once you go kinky, if you can get married and then rein it in and have a more conventional sex life. Well, that is the um, the. Do you know about this thing? How right wing people don't like pornography. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting things about right wing people that are yeah. fascinating. You like, mean they profess to not like pornography? Yeah, I'm not saying they don't watch yeah. it. I'm saying it's a it's a uh, a thought uh, a stream of, of thought in the right wing osphere yeah. that pornography is bad and it's like anti fap. It's a, it's it's the online right wing. It's the neo right wing. My my other favorite thing. I'll get back to the technology. The the best part, the most interesting detail about them is they don't like. And I'm not saying this is like Mitt Romney. I'm saying this is like, you know, the kind of 4 chan sort of. Yeah. They, they don't like modern art. <laughs> they, they're anti-modern art. Not uh, all of them, but it's a stream of thought in their world yeah. that modern art is degenerate. Uh-huh. And uh, representative art is good. Classical, yeah, yeah. Cl- you know. And it, there's a, it's, it's kind of the most interesting philosophical thing about that I've learned about them. Like, that's really fascinating. Yeah, like, it is. The idea of deconstructing, because it's kind of ports over to what they're talking about, the things that they're rallying against in society, right? right? Is like, you know, uh, trans rights and, uh, you know, the, uh, a, a reconfiguration of, of, of the, r- the racial mosaic in our society. Like, they're saying, like, we don't like when things become deconstructed and... Uh, harder to understand and harder right, to grasp. We like, right. I like when an apple looks like an apple. Yes. I want a bowl of fruit and that's no, it. Look at Barbie, the Barbie movie. Like it was a representation of Greta Herwig's vision of something. Yeah. And you watch a movie and you go, all right, I'm looking through the lens of an artist. Right. That's it. it yeah. uh, it's not saying we need to all be this or subscribe to this, but can you take a step back and appreciate art for being a snapshot of somebody else's mind. Well, that's the problem is that it, politics has infected everybody's brain to such a degree. And this is not a right wing problem. This is an everybody problem yes. where people just think that they, they, they've got news brain and, yeah. and they think everything is. I was looking. I follow all these um, uh, surfing um, like blooper accounts uh, like kook slams you know yeah. and there was some great video the other day of some guy cutting some other guy off and it was a really funny video and then one of the first comments is like biden voter guaranteed yeah. it's like why no why? i made a mistake why is he a biden voter i was driving in to do a spot this weekend and i'm on la cienega and this gas station and the gas price and i'm not making this up was seven dollars and 35 cents sure so I just took a snapshot on it, and it, but underneath the price, it said lottery tickets. And I go, it's a wonder people are buying lottery tickets at this point. Sure. Just a stupid little joke, but yeah, more yeah, about yeah. showing people how either I, my account blew up with right wing people saying exactly, Biden brought you these gas prices. Right. And I could easily get on and say, um, you know, I could defend these, you know, Biden against these gas prices and saying like none of this has anything. But why? Right, I saw the right. other people doing that for me and both sides were not listening. Both sides were just throwing rocks. Yeah. It's just it's a- I wish there was a dialogue. I wish to God that had sparked a dialogue where people went, oh, I didn't know that. I see what you're saying. But here's my take. It's not that. Yeah, no, I mean, it, but it's be, it's because people are no longer. It's not dialogue's not accessible when you have reaction, like 
a man surfing poorly must be a Biden voter yeah. or a man being a jerk in traffic must be a Trump voter. Right. It's like you're no longer in. That's not politics. That's you're you're now in ideological Do kind of camp. Do we get out of this? No, 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 no. We, it's getting much worse. It's yeah. going to get a lot worse, I think, because, okay, you want to really get scared? Yeah. Uh, maybe you've already talked about this on the podcast, but the re- like uh, one of the biggest issues, I mean, the reason that you, can, um, that you can foment that kind of frenzy where anything that is bad in society is because of your political adversary, yeah. anything, anything bad is, is politics. A, a big way that you get there is through uh, b- misinformation, right? Uh, right? Fake fake news, right? right. And the, the the way fake news has generally happened is that a person had to r- write the fake news. They had to go type the conspiracy theory and write the fake news. Right. Uh, and it took labor. But now with ChatGPT uh, and AI, uh, all you yeah. all I have to do is go to ChatGPT and say, "Hey, I need an article that's uh, with sources yeah. that uh, um, that says that uh, g- g- that bad surfing is because of Joe Biden," yeah. and it'll write me in one second. Nice. It will write me as long an article as I want, and uh, you know I could get it and I could read it. and I go, actually, you can literally do this. You can go, oh, this article isn't. Um, uh, I- inflammatory enough. I needed uh, to make uh, I needed to make Biden voters look much worse. I need to make Trump voters look like they are about to plan an attack. And it'll okay. just do anything you want. Wow. It's got some little safeguards, but not many. Yeah, I know there's a little bit of safeguarding on it, but yeah, it's, they, but also you can get it to write the article and then tweak it and make it worse. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah it, it safeguards can be easily overridden well, and by now, you. I mean, it's almost there, but you look at Kyle Dunnigan's account and you realize like how close we can get to making some somebody look like somebody else and doing an impression of them and putting words into their mouth. So they say the first big, um, the first big stanza in, uh, in the AI like infection, if there, if if we don't figure out a way to use it and have real meaningful, uh, toothsome uh, safeguards around it is the dissolution of our ability to tell the true from the false. We think we already are in that state, but we're not. Mm-hmm. We're we're now it's worse than it used to be, but there's still this sort of standard of like, you know, if you're a thoughtful person, you can kind of go back and say, well, there's certain things I kind of trust, kind of. Right. That's going to go away. Yeah. And that's really really scary. Well, like, especially because the news sources that we have subscribed to as being neutral and being de facto are no longer no longer have foreign offices in Afghanistan or in Tabul because they don't have the money anymore because right. there's no subscriptions. Right. So, you know, the Wall Street Journal or the Guardian or whoever you believe. Right. Is, there's no human there going, right. I saw it, it's true. Right. And so the person in Kabul could write you uh, a, a, a a harrowing account of what's going on there because they know you'll buy it and it could be a complete lie. And then right. you could be like, wait, you're not in Kabul. You're some yeah. guy in Iowa who said right. that your name was such and such and that you were, you know, had lived there your whole life. So that I think is going to make things like w- way worse. Yeah. And I don't know what, I don't know. I I guess I need to be more optimistic, but I'm not necessarily. Well, I mean, I try to imagine scenarios where things change and they usually involve a world war or a major terrorist event. I yeah. mean, you know, 9-11 kind of brought people together for a minute. Obviously, the world wars br- bring people together. but oh, So um, we can hope. Here's hoping. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like that's <laughs> Mrs. The only- Fitzsimmons, if you're listening, if you could help us get there. <laughs> we're sorry about the sex talk, but if you could somehow create a world war. Oh, my God. Do your, do your parents listen to your podcast? No, my own? mother's deaf, Greg, and you know that. Oh! Yeah, and that, after kept bringing me across town and having the audacity to ask me if she listens. <laughs> so, let me say, you're lucky. Yeah. You're lucky. No, that's fair. Yeah. No, my mom not only uh, is deaf, she would, uh, she would 100%, if you had transcriptions on this podcast, yeah. she would watch 100% of it and would love every minute I of it. I love Jewish people. My wife is half Jewish and her family's the same way. They just- Don't care. They're, well, there's no shame. I, I right. know there's shame and guilt. Well, there's guilt. I think the Christians have the shame and the Jews have the guilt. Sure. But there's also an acceptance. There's a, I, I just know that when I started dating Jewish girls when I was at Boston University, 
I'd never seen a girl get up out of bed after sex and walk fully naked to the bathroom and back or talk about oh, what she needed and wanted during sex. Like, I was like, what is this freedom? What That's is this? Fascinating. And then I also noticed that, like, it's a it's a culture. The Jewish culture is a dialogue. the The Christian culture is a monologue. You listen, right, right. But whereas you guys explore ideas, you accept ideas. But by the way, you're um, you're Catholic, right? Yeah. So that's the worst. Yeah. Catholics and Mormons it's are kind of they're the worst ones. Right. I mean, not worse. Mrs. Fitzsimmons, please. She's very Catholic. Not the worst. Yeah. What I mean is, in terms of hangups around sex and sexuality, yeah. that there it's it might be the. I mean, honestly, Islam might be worse, but I don't know. I, I don't know. But yeah. like Catholics and Mormons, like, but that's so interesting, that walk of confident, the opposite of a walk of shame. That's so yeah. interesting because, yeah, that's my reality. My whole life, I was raised uh, with just an absolute 0% shame around sex and sexuality. In fact, uh, as I say in my book, um, like it would have been, it would have been, I'm not saying it would have, uh, she should have uh made us feel ashamed but like a little less acceptance would have yeah. been okay it yeah. would have been acceptable yeah, 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 yeah. like we always got the impression in my family not only would it have been okay if we were gay it would have been preferred yes straight up san francisco yeah she's course. like are you sure you're not gay we right. would we would love it if yeah. we could just have a little gay son i wish one of my kids was gay sure i, I, I shouldn't say wish i am you wish neutral. they were different in any way I, you wish they had a different personality in some way is what you're saying well officially. i will be honest with you having a straight white son he is up against trying to stand out right now. Uh -huh, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I'm not one of those guys like, oh, it's just fucking unfair because it was, we had a slight advantage. We had a good for, run anyway. Forever. We had a good we run. A good yeah, run. Yeah. But I also feel for him because I know he's going out for jobs and they're just, you know, he's at the bottom of the list. And I think if he was gay, you know, I guess I'd want grandkids, but they could adopt, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, they can actually biologically impregnate people too have you ever had gay sex i have not no uh i did look down so you might be doubting that that's true you did look down I and did. left well i <laughs> and my i dick, never had gay ironically <laughs> your dick by the way mrs fitzsimmons his dick is down to the left i don't know why it's all the way down there but it is um no uh i have the i have not but i have looked at gay porn plenty what do you think about that? I've looked at gay porn. I've looked at tran porn. And I, I always like, like when I was young, I was, I don't know why, but I always felt curious about yeah. homosexuality. And then when I got into college, I got really into Ginsburg and then, you know, even like, uh, um, Walt Whitman and all of the, the there was a lot of homoerotic imagery and that yeah. stuff and I and I got really into it and then of course I I loved Iggy Pop and David right. Bowie and well they were j just setting on fire all conventions of right. of heterosexuality and I saw it as a way of you know I had already done every drug I'd already had different yeah. kinds of sex and yeah. and I was very curious and so I thought maybe I would really like to try it at some point yeah. And I got close once. I went into the Brambles in the Fenway in oh, Boston. Oh wow! Yeah, I was shit faced. I was in college, and I was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do this." And I went in, and uh, it was like it really was like a fall night with shadows coming through the leaves. <laughs> and I was like, "I didn't know how it worked." And like, and then this guy just like appeared. Uh huh. And he walks up to me, and I look at him. I was like, "All right, I guess this is happening." And then he undoes his fly. And he pulls it out, and I just look at it, and I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm just not interested. Just, I felt nothing. And you turned around and just No, I away. got scared, and so I pushed him. Because at him. this point, you're, you pushed I him? Pushed it wasn't him. his fault. It's no, your fault. No, I know. <laughs> what did like, he do? It was like oh, the mildest no. gay bashing the guy had ever experienced. I just kind of pushed him, and then he like ran off into the woods with his dick flopping out, and I walked out, and I was like, well, I guess it's, that's not going to happen. It's such a funny uh narrative for you because it's like what are you doing sir i am merely taking a walk through this municipal park at four in the morning what do you think this is right this park that's littered with condoms yeah i bet he by the way uh didn't enjoy being pushed but i i don't think there was any part of that man that was like what just happened yeah. he was like i see the guy's done all the drugs he likes Iggy pop and david bowie and he thought he's done everything maybe he tried this but then he got here and he looked at the dick and he's like maybe a little bit too much for me and then yeah. he pushed me yeah i um i was his rite of passage you know what's weird is i think that i 
I think I'm surprised you never did. Well, I, me too. And I think that as I've gotten older, I mean, now I'm in a monogamous relationship with my wife, but I actually think that I would be more likely to try um, that kind of tete-a-tete now as a as a, a, a an older man than I would have when I was young. Because even though I was like a progressive and raised with all, with very few hangups, I still had, you can't escape uh, homophobia completely. Yeah. I still had like ambient things about like masculinity, what it means. Right. I feel like much of that is gone. Most of it is in my um my truck and in the um yeah. the P trap on on the um You're gonna blow a guy in that truck. Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> I'll bring him to the truck. I'll <laughs> blow him and while I'm down there I'll open up the uh the plumbing and I'll say, check this out. It's pretty nice. Right? If you look, speaking of plumbing uh, yeah, right. now that we've cleaned your pipes, yeah. check this out. What do you think, sir? <laughs> Yeah, Natasha's like, why do you have a mattress in the truck? That's weird. You know, I always said about uh, gay cruising parks that they are the ultimate um, iteration of, like, why, like, of male of male sexuality. Like, it has those parks aren't about gayness; they're about maleness. Yeah, that we are that males are so horny that if two men like to fuck each other, they will literally just set up like open air fields, yeah. like flea markets of All just right. like free sex. Yeah. Like it has nothing to do with gay. A gay cruising I think part. that is part of what drew me to it was the idea that I was so horny and, and it could happen I now. wanted women to want to be as horny as I was. Right. And the idea that the other partner would just be that into it was so appealing. No, to that's me. what I said in this bit. I said, you know, I can prove it has nothing to do with gay being gay because you've never heard of a lesbian sex cruising park. Have you? No, like they don't they do not exist. Right. Um, so is that true? A lesbian cruising park? I could be wrong, but I don't believe that that exists. It really is about male sex and sexuality, those parts, yeah. to me. To me. Right, That's right. what men want. If we could, I said in the in the joke, I go, yeah, listen, if we could convince women to hide in bushes and suck our dicks, yeah. we would. Yeah. But historically, they've been very cool to the idea. Yeah, right, right. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I was in a, uh, in, in uh, San Francisco, there used to be this kind of uh, peep show place near the punchline. The Lusty Lady. Is that what it's called? Called the Lusty Lady. Uh, and interestingly, I have a great story about this place, but interestingly, the first unionized um, strip club in America. Oh, they right, yeah. right. Sex Workers There's of the World Unite. There's a great book I want you to read, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it was written by my wife's cousin named Rachel Kushner, uh -huh. and she wrote a book called The Mars Room, which is uh, set in a strip club in San Francisco. Oh, cool. And it's it, fiction. It is one of the best novels I've ever read in my life, but it really is about growing up in that kind of crazy I'll world. I'll 100% read that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to send it to you. I do a thing on my podcast where I do appreciate guests coming here, and I almost always send a guest a book after the I podcast love that. that we've talked about. Did you hear what happened with my book? What? This is a little weird, but I really want to tell the story about the lusty lady. So, oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you the Lusty Lady story, and we'll get back to this. Yeah. So I walk into the Lusty Lady, and, you know, I'm young, and, yeah. and I'm like 29, and, and I walk into a peep show thing, and I get the tokens. Sure. I mean, can you imagine if they put a black light on a token for a <laughs> peep show? And I, I put a couple in, and, you know, they show you the most hard. It's like German Shepherd. It's like horrible. Oh, it was a porn peep show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not the Lusty Lady. It's something okay. else. Yeah. So uh, I look at it, and then I notice a light flickering to the left of me. And I was like, that's fucking weird. And I look over, and there's a hole in the wall. Yeah, sure. It's a classic. And I was like, and, and then I hear a guy go into that stall. And I was like, looking at the hole, and I was just like. Huh? I could put the hole. I could, <laughs> that hole's you, there. It's there. Well, you know why? I mean, that is, it's so funny we keep coming back to it. All those, that situation is about gay shame. It's yeah. about guys that are like, I want to have a blowjob from a man or from whomever, but I need to be looking at straight pornography in order to, to, to do that. Yeah. So I'll just put my dick over in this hole. Like I went to this club in San Francisco called the Power Exchange uh -huh. once upon a time, which was like a, it's like a sex, a full on sex club. And, um, and you know, in theory, it's supposed to be everybody. You, there's, there's multiple floors. There was a men's only floor. And then the second floor was women, men, women, and trans women. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and if you're a woman, you could uh, essentially get in for free. Uh, yeah. If you're a trans woman or a woman, you get in for free. If you're a man, you pay a bunch of money. And if you're a man in a on a date with a woman, you could get in for some. Price. And then there was another tiered pricing, which is if you wore a towel only, 
you could get in for a cheaper price, but if you yeah. wanted to wear your street clothes, it was more expensive. The whole thing, there was a there was a lot of tears to it. Yeah. So I went in, and you know, it was uh, it was there was I went in with a woman actually, and she was the only well, like there was basically no women. There were some women in these like private bedrooms where uh, they would be with a partner, and what they were getting off on oh, was sleeping with their yeah. partner in front while horny men watched. Right. Uh, but the only like uh, um, free range woman was the one that I had brought with me. Uh -huh. I wasn't even sleeping with her. She was just a friend, and we yeah. were like going to check it out. And uh, we went with a gay guy that was like, bye, and went upstairs to just actually have fun. <laughs> and I was walking around. It was a very interesting phenomenon because there was no women. And there were really no trans women. Uh -huh. Like, really. But what there were a lot of was men in wigs. Uh, like, just like a, a older Filipino postal worker still wearing his, like, blues from the uh, rounds that day. Just kind of with an akimbo wig. Yeah, and, like and a was... last-minute Halloween costume. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. It was definitely not like... And so the, the men that were there, like, there was these, like, three stages of men that were there. There was excited new arrival in a towel. There was disappointed acceptance, uh, disappointed uh, awareness of what was happening. And then there was... Um, getting a blowjob from a postal worker in a wig. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, like, it was like, you definitely felt like this system isn't quite worked out for yeah, what people want because right. the real, like, not listen, they might have been actually trans women, but it, I got the impression that the real trans women and, uh, and, and, and women were <laughs> there's nowhere right, to be found. Right. Um, I've always thought with clubs like that, that the smart move is hire 10 prostitutes. Uh huh. Give them a lot of money. Sure. And have them just, you know, go crazy Do with all thing. those guys and they'll tell their friends and the place will be packed. And it doesn't matter. Everybody doesn't have to get late. As long as you know some guys the are, you're going to keep coming it's back. It's like when Chappelle does your open mic, you know? Right. It's like the, there was a, a, an open mic in San Francisco called The Marsh and Robin Williams would come and drop in every yeah. like six months. It kept that place open for years because right, the possibility right. that yep. Robin Williams might be coming. Okay, so wait, the Lusty Lady. Yeah. So I used to go to the Lusty Lady a lot, and it's different than what it's you're a talking strip about. Club? It's a peep show strip club. Yeah. So what it is is you walk in. It's not pornography. There are women in in oh, sure. in the room yeah. dancing, and you put quarters in, and the quarter will give you twenty seconds, uh -huh. and the the the, the window rolls a window up. rolls up, and it's open for about 15, 20 seconds, and inside there's women that will come over and shake their butt, and mm -hmm. you you ostensibly you jerk off. Like that is yeah. the great advantage of it to a real strip club is that you you're in a, a private booth and you can masturbate. Yeah. So I used to go there, um, and it was fun, and I would go pretty regularly, and I went in one time. And I put the quarters in and the thing slides up and I look over and right in front of me, spread eagle, is this woman that I knew from AA meetings. No. And I'm like, oh no. Wow. And she's making eye contact with me and I'm making eye contact with her and I don't know what to do and she doesn't really know what to do. And she's like, I mean, she, what is, I, I can't run out because it's, uh -huh. too, it's too embarrassing to like turn around and be like, sorry. And just so I, yeah, I kind of like gave her an awkward smile and just waited. I mean, you know how some seconds are hours and yeah. some hours are yeah. seconds. Like the 15 seconds was so excruciating because I'm like, please close, please close, yeah. please close. And finally, the thing just she's just like uh, this awkward face uh, and and it just goes and closes. And I'm like so relieved. I threw her a couple bucks uh, in the tip jar because she's getting her shit together. You know, she's newly sober. Yeah. And I walk out and then I'm like, damn, I can never go back. Because yeah. she'll be in there, but I went back. They did go I went, back. I went back. I just pulled my hood really far <laughs> over my face and hope, hoped for the best. Like the guy from the Bill Cosby cartoon. Not yes, like that. Oh, yes, like that guy. All right, listen. Let me get to. I don't want to keep you all day because I know you want to surf, but I have. Uh, There's a thing we do called fast fastballs with fits. Okay. I'm going to ask you some questions. I ask all love it of my uh, comedians uh, that are guests. Um, who was the worst opener on the road you ever had? The worst opener I ever had on the road? You want me to call him out by name? No, just describe what happened. Well, I can I say, um, I could tell you the worst situation I ever had opening. Okay, that's better. Um, there was, I opened for, uh, Bruce Bruce a couple times, actually. Bruce yeah. Bruce would, uh, call and ask for a white opener at this club called Pepperbellies, um, that has since burned down. 
and he uh, he wanted a white opener. So I would uh, I just I, so people know Bruce Bruce is uh, black. Yeah, black comic, a great black comic, very funny, black super comic. super yeah. funny, and um, and his middle act. I don't know, maybe it still is. I looked him up recently. He's still active. Was a comedian called Black Boy, mm-hmm. and that was his name. Yeah, and so I would go on stage at Pepper Bellies to Bruce Bruce's audience is not just they're not just all black they're like kind of um conservative you know they're like not like politically conservative but just like church going middle aged they're not like young and up for every single thing i mean they're yeah. they're a good audience but anyway the point of it is my sets were would range from a like 50% to a to a kind of a zero it was ne- i never was like i'm the king yeah uh so i so why did he want white openers probably just shake it up a yeah. little bit i've okay. heard of that before yeah. with the black act like not you know not to have the same kind of and but I did fine. But then my problem was at the end of my set, I knew what was coming, which is what I was going to have to tell this audience that was barely interested in what I was saying. I was going to have to introduce a guy that they'd probably never heard of by the name yeah. Black Boy. And they don't know that oh, that's the God. guy's real name. And they don't know that I'm not just some <laughs> like pissed off guy that didn't have the greatest set or this whatever. This is why he hires a white guy, just for that moment. <laughs> and so I go... Fuck! I keep thinking about it. And finally, I just go, okay. Well, anyway, that's the end of my time. I just want to introduce you for BT and other places, ladies and gentlemen. Black boy, and you could hear the audience go like, "What? <laughs> like, what the fuck did he just say?" And I would just put my head down and fucking beeline to the back of the club, and just ho- and 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 hope that he would reintroduce himself as he yeah. got out. And he was very funny because, well, I mean, this was. <laughs> He, I, uh, he would say every t- if I had a good set, he would say, "Give it up for my man." Yeah. And if I had a bad set, he would pretend he didn't know who I was. And I'd be like, "We've been working together for like eight shows, you know." He'd be like, "Who the fuck was that?" I go, "What do you mean, who the fuck was that? Have you never had a bad show?" Anyway. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Uh, what is there's two types of people in the world? Yes. Go. Oh. There's two types, well, Democrats and Republicans and Democrats, <laughs> you know, they're trying to ruin everything. Two types of people in the world. Um, I Well, I could make it political. There are people that want the world to be weirder and people that want the world to stay the same. Yeah. And I'm in the weirder camp for sure. I want everything to get weirder. Interesting. Always. I want it to be good. I want it to yeah. be positive. I yeah. don't want it to be more violent, but I always want things to get more bizarre. Why would you want more of the same? I've never understood the idea of- Well, the- I think in a sense, even though the media portrays- us all as what's really just the fringe five percent on either side sure the truth is the middle part with the legalization of pot and streaming is way less interesting and is doing way less things doing the, less the stuff. couch has gotten really good yeah that's interesting you're saying generally life is becoming less interesting i think people used to you know work on their trucks and that's they used to paint and they used to go out together and bowl and I all will that say stuff. this i will say this about um the political right wing as i was saying before i'm, I'm fascinated they don't like abstract art they uh they don't like uh what was the other thing i said they didn't like but anyway, they're getting trans more trans reading books. Oh, no, something else though. Anyway, whatever. They are getting more interesting. Yeah. Like the Republicans of my father's era, like Reagan Republicans, fucking boring. They liked censorship. They were just like, now these guys are like they like coke, they like jet skis, group sex. Yeah, they love jet they, skis. They're into they're into much more interesting yeah, shit. Yeah. So uh, that's true. It, there are worse fates on earth than ending up in Miami in a uh, a, a rising sea tide doing coke off of the uh, <laughs> Brazilian butt lift of your uh, conservative partner. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> Uh, have you ever not finished a set on stage? Have I? Oh, have I ever not? E- hmm. What is you? You mean just give up? Give up. Get thrown off a stage. Uh, quit. Um, Wasn't I with you that night? Somebody started choking. Oh, that's right. And I and I I gave him the Heimlich maneuver, but the guy was gigantic, right. and he didn't need the Heimlich maneuver. He wasn't yeah. choking. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. having heat stroke, but yes. I like, got behind this man and was just like, ah, ah, and it was doing absolutely no good. And well, because the store that night, the air conditioning had gone out. It was like ninety degrees inside. I mean, how funny! How funny that is it for was that guy? Hilarious to be like a big dude that's just really hot having heat stroke and then you look back and there's like me with my little Gucci glasses going don't worry honey we're gonna take good care of you <laughs> but then I went right on stage and I was on when it happened you were on when it and happened and you I introduced brought me. you up 
But that's right. To my credit, I covered that time. You did. I waited until you did. the whole situation was resolved. No, it was cool. And I, then you had to follow that. Yeah, actually, you were in a better position because at least there were things to play with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I had left was the uh, ambient weirdness in the room that yeah. somebody almost perished <laughs> <laughs> in the in the OR at the comedy store. It was amazing though because Curtis, who was the manager there. New CPR, and he came in, and he like he, right. he didn't necessarily do CPR, but, but he definitely took over as a medical yeah, professional. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. got a different vibe than um, guy who's been doing stand up, who's seen a video of the Heimlich <laughs> maneuver, trying it on somebody. I mean, I just didn't know what I was doing, right. but I knew I wasn't supposed to do nothing, so yeah. I just sort of I probably just broke a couple of his ribs. I shouldn't even be admitting this on your yeah, podcast. Yeah, He's going right. to come litigate. Uh, all right, finally. Uh, I want to ask you, what is the hackiest bit that you've ever done? Well, actually, you know, the hackiest bit I am doing currently, I, <laughs> this is what happens to me, is I have these long bits, and in the middle of it will be something I don't love, and it's like, I, it's hard for, I don't know how to remove it, because it's a, like, a, it's a, it's a, um, a widget in this bigger yeah, structure, right. so I do this whole bit about um, consent and the sexual experience ladder, uh, is this thing I've made up, which is like, you know, you used to slowly walk up the cons the sexual experience ladder, learning as you went up there, like, uh, and and you would start at the very bottom, which is just like kissing, and I do a bit for kissing, and then a bit for, um, you know, um, fondling a girl's breasts, and then a bit for um, fingering someone, and I like all these bits, and then I get to oral sex, and I say, um, I say, uh, oral sex, now that's not easy, um, every I really don't like the bit, but it does well. Yeah, I go that that part's not easy to figure out because that's kind of the concept is you're like figure stumbling through stuff trying to figure yeah. it out. I go that's not easy either. You know, it's hard to figure out how to do it. I would say the first um, the first four hundred blowjobs I had were terrible. <laughs> I go I go and and that's okay. You know, I say um, but you know but I will say this: every bad blowjob ends with the same question. It's just uh, this is the part I hate the, the act out. Uh, yeah. like this. I go like that. Fucking, of course not. <laughs> of co not like that. You thought that's what all the hype of the blowjob was about? Was this awkward tooth-based interaction? Listen, I know you don't like have a penis, but fucking use your imagination. Try to extrapolate what pleasure could feel like. I go well. I don't have a vagina, but I don't go down on women by fucking jabbing my face into their vagina. Anyway, so I don't love. <laughs> the whole part the whole chunk yeah. but especially the act out part yeah. it feels piggish yeah. and just kind of like beneath the whole rest of the bit but I don't know yeah. what to do instead yeah sometimes you have a bit where you realize that if you know uh, Ali Wong walked in while you were doing that moment <laughs> she would think so much less of you and she didn't see the rest yeah, of the yeah, bit yeah 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 it's a whole there's a ladder this yeah. is just a bad wrong Ali well that's why you don't allow uh cell phones in uh in comedy clubs because they can grab that one little piece and put it up and even on this podcast somebody can clip out you saying black boy uh -huh, and just sure. put that up good good thing that you kind of shouted that yes, out so that yes. they have that idea right. now and that would be at one hour and 14 minutes in all right all right listen if you want to go see moshe kasher you can go to uh, Wenatchee, Washington on September 29th. Right. What's that? I, it's like um, a place in between uh, Seattle and Tacoma. And oh. I'm actually really excited about it because I love Washington. It's at a performing arts center. My friend Drennan Davis, who's a super talented comedian, is coming to open for me. And apparently my agent was telling me that there's all these, and, and this makes sense, you know, there's all these little kind of ex-urban places yeah. that are that are um, sprouting up around the country where there's like cool communities in places that you wouldn't have thought of places that can support a, uh, a stand up show. And this is an, uh, an ex uh, Those experiment are with that. The best live shows when it's a community that like half the crowd was here last week. Right. Exactly. Like they come back cause they are comedy. It's fans. that kind of thing apparently. And there's I'm excited. There's a place in Lafayette, Louisiana that's like that. Yeah. I, I, and he says it's happening more and more. It makes sense because people left, a lot of people left big urban areas okay. and, and started like, you know, finding a cool town that they right, could live right. in. So that one will be fun. And then uh, what Santa else? Santa Cruz on October 6th and 7th. A classically cool place. What's uh, it the, called? It's, uh, the, that's a Santa Cruz comedy festival, mm -hmm. actually. And me and Louis Katz and uh, Marcella Arguello are all uh, oh, nice. doing a three-person show. So I'm excited. That'll be Louis's really fun. Louis from that neck of the woods, isn't he? Louis is also somebody that started up in San Francisco. Right. Yeah. San Diego. 
I mean, he started before me. He was like, like one of my like, whoa, look at this guy. Yeah. When I first, I was like, this guy's fucking got it. Actually, yeah. Louis stopped me in my early days, and you know, because I do a lot of st- um, crowd work and I mess yeah. around a lot. Yeah. And Louis goes, you, you haven't been doing stand up long enough to be that confident on stage. He's like, you don't, you need to go write, like, stop doing crowd work and go write a bunch of jokes. And I took it very seriously. I was like, yeah. okay. I stopped messing around on stage. I started just writing and writing and writing. Yeah. And then finally, when I felt like ready, I reincorporated. Right. Uh, so Louis is one of my dearest friends, That's but also advice. one of my the wizards in my comedy career. He just got married a few months ago. I, I know. Uh, and then San Diego, the American Comedy Company. Oh, well, December. before that, I'll be in San Francisco at the Punchline, the 11th Ooh. through the 14th, the, my oh, home right. club. Uh, that's going to be really fun with Brent Weinbach is featuring one of the funniest dudes. I hung dudes. out with him two nights ago. Oh, did you? Yeah. I'm doing um, an interesting thing there. Uh, I'm doing two different shows over the course of the weekend. Um, so every other show is a different show. Uh, my, uh, I do, I'm do. i doing all cr- crowd work shows. Um and then uh, I'm doing like a one man show that like a proper full on one man show kind of like m- maybe my next special kind of thing. Yeah. The one man show is an exploration. Of a lot of what we've been talking about masculinity, what it means to be a man, how I became a man. That's called Samson. And then the other shows are all crowd work. So you could actually come to both shows and see two completely different oh, shows. That's that amazing. Weekend. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You're one of the one of the great crowd work guys. Oh, like, one you. of your specials was all crowd work. Wasn't I did it? an album that was all crowd work. Yeah. Called yeah. Crowd surfing. Yeah. Um, all right, and for tickets, go to Moshe Kasher, M O S H E C K A S H E R. Yeah, M O S H E K A S H E R dot com. Um, and uh, check out his own podcast, which he does with his wife called The Endless Honeymoon. Yes, yes. And uh, catch him at shows around LA. This has been so great. And to, I want to apologize to your mom. I love uh, your son, and I, I'm sure if I met you, I would love you too. I think you're a great person. All right, thank you. She'll appreciate that. Oh.